Good afternoon, everyone. This is Ali Masardo, Senior Association Manager of PPRA. Thank you for joining us today for the roadresource.org webinar, Maintaining More with Less. This is the second webinar in the head of, of the CURB webinar series for roadresource.org. We do have you all on mute for the webinar and we'll be using the question function for any questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. A brief introduction before we begin. Lindsay Matouche is president and CEO, and Grace Sansbury is an account executive at Vario Consulting, the marketing firm that has partnered with PPRA to create roadresource.org. Over the course of the year, they will, they will present a series of webinars on roadresource.org. We also have Jerry Dankbar, street maintenance superintendent of the city of Roseville, California, who will be joining Lindsay and Grace today. We will now turn the webinar over to Lindsay and Grace. Thanks, Allie. And, uh... Thanks to those of you who are joining us today. We know um, that now is a very busy time, so we promise to make the most of the hour. Um, we'll start, Grace, if we can get the slides loaded, thank you. Um, we'll start by uh, just saying thank you. We know that um, all day, every day, you all are the ones maintaining the assets that keep our cities moving and um, always struggling to do more with less. Uh, so we thank you for that and now know that with COVID impacting our country that you are as busy as you have ever been. Um, we had this webinar series loaded for the year and after COVID impacted our country, we realized, wow, we hear now more than ever agencies talking about how do I stretch my resources? How do I do more with less? And if you, as you all are figuring out how this is going to impact your agencies, um, we're hearing kind of two veins of thought. We're hearing a lot of people talking about budget cuts and halted projects and freezing spending and decreased gas taxes and revenue. We also see some agencies uh, or, or DOTs expediting projects. Uh, we hear some rumblings about potential stimulus and, and then of course the taxpayer element of of the conversation uh saying hey let's fix the roads while everybody's at home uh, so we know that now you're stretched as thin as you've ever been uh, and so we repurposed this webinar series to really focus on answering two major questions first with increased budget demands how do you continue to improve your road network how do you get ahead of this so that whenever we come out the other side, we are not looking at networks that are further deteriorated? And thereby, how do you put every dollar to use more or most effectively? Uh, so we're uh, excited to have Jerry with us today. Um, Jerry can speak to these things in the context of what he's done in his own network. So we're gonna cover four things. Um, to let him talk a little bit about Roseville and what he has seen at the city of Roseville. We'll have him talk about his toolbox of treatments and the different treatments that he uses to maintain his network, talk about his approach to his pavement preservation program. Then I'll give you some really fantastic examples about taxpayer communication and communication to elected officials. Uh, after the last webinar, we did a survey asking people, what's on your mind? What else do you want us to know? We'll do that again today. And uh, one of the things that surfaced for uh, many of you is this idea of communication. So Jerry will be able to speak to that and give you some real world examples. Give you one quick slide on uh, who PPRA is as um, kind of the builder or um, the dreamer of roadresource.org. Uh, for those of you who haven't joined us before. So the, the brainchild of three associations, the Asphalt Emulsion Manufacturers Association, the International Slurry Surfacing Association, and the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association, who came together and, and started with a research project to ask agencies all over North America what they wanted and needed and what tools would add value to them from the industry. And, and the answer, in short, was kind of a simple streamlined resource that put everything in one place. So they came together to build the Pavement Preservation Recycling Alliance, um, which, which created roadresource.org. Uh, so that's who's 
kind of speaking to you today, um, and, and we have a, a singular focus and promise, and that is this. We empower agencies to be the best possible stewards of their road networks and taxpayer dollars. So when we're evaluating what tools make the website, what content of webinar would be valuable to you, um, this is the grid through, through which we run everything. Um, it's what we aim to do. So before uh, we dive into the content, I want to do a, a couple quick polls so that we understand who is with us today. So the first thing I want to know, you should see this pop up on your screen, is how many lane miles are in your network? So you should see this pop up and you'll just select one of the following. Give you just um, a few seconds here. Great, I can see you guys taking that. We have about 210 people that have joined us so far. We had almost 400 people register for this webinar from all over North America. Oh, interesting. Give you just about three or four more seconds. Looks like we have about a third of attendees in the zero to 500 uh, range. Like we have a quarter of attendees in the over 20 or over 3,500 range, and then fairly even distribution in between. We'll do one more quick poll. And that is, what is your road budget? We kind of want to, we wanted to get a sense of what types of budgets we're speaking to today. And Jerry, that may help you contextualize a little bit about how you tell your own story. All right. Wow, interesting. Okay, so we have about um, a quarter of people or so in the under a million category, another quarter in the one to three, um, and then about a third over seven million. So it looks like we have uh, an interesting spread, um, a few in between with uh, actually some bigger uh, agencies on the webinar today than usual. Thanks for uh, taking the time to share that with us. So I'm excited to introduce Jerry Dankbar. Jerry and I had the pleasure of speaking together at RAP in California earlier this year, and we thought his story would be especially relevant to agencies all over the country who are looking at how they stretch their resources further today. So Jerry began his career in public works with the County of Sacramento in 89, where he started as a maintenance worker, was promoted to senior supervisor, and then in 2000, joined the public works team at the city of Roseville, where he has been the street maintenance superintendent for 20 years. Um, so he oversees all aspects of drainage, paving, sweeping, pavement marking, street signs, and the street resurfacing program. Uh, he has a two-year certificate in total quality management uh, from the American River College. And he is a very active industry leader and advocate in APWA, MSA, IMSA, um, and the acronyms continue. When he's not leading a webinar, he uh, is out riding his motorcycle or hiking in the Sierras. So we're glad you could take a break from motorcycle riding to join us today, Jerry. Um, we're excited for you to hear his story because he is going to unpack the results of a 20 year pavement preservation program. Um, so he brought much of the thinking to the city of Roseville when he joined the team 20 years ago and he weathered 2008. So if we look at recession or at least impacts to budgets, he'll be able to tell you how he navigated that. Uh, we thought that would be especially relevant during this time uh, with so much uncertainty. He's going to talk about the toolbox of treatments. He introduced quite a number of new treatments to the city. So he'll talk a little bit about that process, which treatments he uses today. Uh, and again, some of the best example of taxpayer and elected communication that we've seen across the industry. So he's going to share some of that as well. So without further ado, Jerry, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lindsay. Can you hear me okay? Are you, you guys hear me okay? Good, good. Um, so as Lynn said, I'm Jerry Dankbar, City of Roseville Superintendent, and been here 20 years. A lot of the stuff that we've learned over the way has been learn as you go. 
You know, you try things new, you see what works, you talk to other agencies, and I'll get into that a little bit later. But the city of Roseville, you know, we're up there in Northern California, just Northeast of Sacramento. Uh, Lane Miles, a little over a thousand, population 139. Our daytime population is around, you know, 200,000. So we have a lot of businesses, a lot of people coming to Roseville for work now. There's a lot of businesses um, in Roseville. So we have kind of reverse commute from Sacramento right now. Um, our average budget um, in the past was 3.5 million or 4.5 million. Um, and that was for road resurfacing only. Right now with the recent um, gas tax increase for California, we, we get around 6.5 million and we may get up to 7 million at some time. Um, with current economic state that may go down, but as of right now, that's kind of where we're at. So on average though, we've, we've only been able to work with 3.5, 4.5 million just for resurfacing work. That doesn't include um, uh, labor materials and, and for my crews and stuff of, of about 35 people. The average pavement condition right now is 76.6 .6 PCI, which is pretty good. We're holding our own because we have a lot of new streets out there and I'll talk about that later. Um, we're a full service city. We have 65 parks, full police and fire uh, libraries, and all of our utilities are owned by the city. So we have Roseville Electric, Roseville uh, Wastewater, Roseville Water Department, and our own solid waste um, garbage collection division too. So we have a lot of divisions and, and, and people like that up here because we, we can control a lot of things and give great service and we don't have to rely on an outside company to do that. And it helps from my point of view because we have problems with other divisions and, and road maintenance. Uh, we can approach utilities right away if they're digging in the street or, or whatever they're doing. So um, the next slide is the, this is a new slide to me. Um, like I said, we're, we're the job, job center of uh, Placer County right now. And what you're seeing on the screen is a graph of how our road network has grown. Um, from 2000, when I got here, um, all the way up until 2020, we, we, you know, we've averaged 200, 300 roads, 300 centerline miles of roads, and now we're up to you know, 485, um, which you'll see in five and six and up into seven and eight, we really grew we had a growth spurt right there. And that's what this graph is showing is where we had that growth spurt and how we were able to overcome that. And we, we had, this was during the recession, we had budget cuts and everything else going on. And, but we still had the roads that were there that needed to be maintained. Um, we had miles of roads out there that were sitting with no houses on them. The words weren't being used. We blocked off all the roads so people wouldn't travel out there. And those roads were just sitting out there um, deteriorating from the sun and the rain. Um, traffic is good for roads, as most of you know, and, and these roads were out there drying up. So with that, we had to deal with that and get those onto our list without any increase in funding. And, and as a matter of fact, the funding goes down after that. So um, I think we talked about that in the next slide. So our centerline miles now are around 485. Um, arterials are 80, collectors around 47, and residentials at 359. Um, most of ours is, is residential, as you can see. We do have a lot of arterials, um, four lane and six lane arterials. Um, I'm looking down because I'm looking at my notes as well. So if you guys see me looking down a little bit. Um, our preservation started in 2000 and uh, we didn't really have a pre preservation program back then. Um, we had done one rubber uh, cape seal in December, actually it was in November before I started in 2000, January of 2000. That's all they did. They started to get the program going and then I came on board and we kept it going from there. Um, we were doing a lot of our work and we got into rubber cave seals, slurry seals in the next few years, even before Caltrans was doing a lot of it. So um, Caltrans is our, our you know, state of California, obviously, and we were looking to them for direction. We had the specifications on it, but we didn't have a lot of direction on what was being done. We didn't have any trials, what was being practiced out there, and what, was, um, what, were, the, what were the best management practices out there for doing these types of processes. So we kind of did it on our own. Um, we set goals for our, ourselves, and we'll talk about the PQIs later. Um, actually, there it is right there. So 75 and 68 was our original PQI numbers that we developed um, in 2000. And we thought we'd have the money to maintain that. And as we got going down the road and, and figured out what we were actually doing, our payment management system was kicking in. Um, we were doing okay with 75 and 68. But as the recession hit, we needed to lower that. And uh, we couldn't maintain what we were doing. We were, we were doing 15 and 20% cuts um, in our budget everywhere. As you can see, the next graph is showing right now, um, the dip in the economy. And uh, we felt it just as bad as anybody else. Um, the whole city was uh, feeling it at that time. And um, During that time, I had lost a few employees. 
Uh, we were we were at 30, 36 or 38 employees. And um, okay, I'm losing where I'm Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. We had 40 on payment bill. You changed the slide on <laughs> We had gas tax cuts, which which was part of our resurfacing. And um, when that happened, that's when we had to lower the PQI. Our general fund got lowered. Um, we actually staff cuts. We had four people we had to um, lay off, but luckily we're, we're a full service city. We were able to have two retirements. We just didn't fill behind those. And then we had a couple transfers. We transferred two employees to uh, our water and our wastewater divisions. So the problem was we continued our pavement condition and expectations. Um, our residents knew it, city council knew it. Uh, we were trying to maintain that, but we just couldn't anymore. So around 2008, 2009, we had to lower that and uh, bring it down a little bit um, to where it was something that was maybe a little more uh, that we could obtain. Um, we lowered it to 72 and 65, and to this day, it's hard to maintain that. So we still don't have the funding we need because of all the new streets that, we're, that we've added on. So. Um, and I'll just quickly say here uh, to preempt a couple questions, uh, Jerry, at the city, you guys use PQI, which to my understanding is very similar to PCI, um, with PCI typically being a point or so higher. So a 75 PQI is probably somewhere around a 76 PCI. So for any of you who aren't familiar, uh, that's the um, that's the breakdown there. And, uh, and I'll just mention uh, in the questions section, in the webinar, I'm monitoring that. So as you have questions, feel free to drop them in there and I will ask some as we go and we'll save some at the end. Okay, great. So we lowered, the, so we went to city council, we lowered it, we lowered it 72 and 65 for overall condition for residential and arterial collector. And like I said, knowing we, we probably couldn't meet that, but we we're gonna try to come close and keep that expectation there. Cause you gotta keep the expectation there a little bit. So we have something to shoot for and if we need more funding, um, that's why we need it. We want to we want to reach that goal and keep trying to reach that goal. So, and we will get there. We're doing okay now, um, but we will get there in the future. So, 2009 and 10 uh, were interesting years. Um, we were able to use the money allocated from other cities. We and, and that was due to we got a federal stimulus package. You guys remember. Um, the stipulation with those with that money was that we needed shovel ready projects. We needed projects that we can get on, get it out right away because that was our direction. They wanted to make sure the cities and counties were getting these projects out and using that money right away to stimulate, stimulate the economy. Um, so we had a few of those only because we had some projects early on that in the prior years, 05 and 06 and 07, that the economy was doing great. We were still doing our projects. Um, and the bids that were coming in were very high. And with that happening, we were just rejecting the bids. We weren't doing the projects. So when you get a typical slurry seal that takes, I don't know, 25 cents a square foot of 30 and people are coming in at 40 and 50 cents a foot, um, we couldn't afford that. We weren't going to do that. We didn't need to do the work that bad. So we just rejected the bid. So that's how able, we were able to have the, the specs ready um, to get the shovel ready projects out the door right away. So. And then when we started um, with the new projects coming on and we in nine and 10, we had that stimulus of money, we had lower costs on the bids, which enabled us to do more resurfacing. So our bids were coming in two, three, four hundred thousand dollars less than our engineer's estimate, uh, probably due to labor and material prices. And we would just add on to that project so we get get all our money spent. Um, that third bullet, we covered a third of our materials in the network. We did. We actually did two major projects. Um, Roughly, if I remember correctly, a little over $6 million total. And we did a my, type two microsurface on our arterials and got a third of them covered up in, in that year and a half. So that was outstanding for us. We were able to use the money from our agencies um, that couldn't use the money, that didn't have the shovel ready projects. And then we just paid them back with gas tax in future years and maybe two or $300,000 a year, $400,000 a year, we were able to pay them back. So the benefit was we got to cover the road early we sealed that road and we didn't have to wait to do it later and let that road deteriorate a couple more years down the road. So the next slide is the PQI versus centerline miles. As you can see in 2020, um, our average PQI is around 66.5, but our center lines are going up. You know, we're 485 to 500 right now. Um, 
and that's not going to go away. We're, we're still building roads out here and we still have the same funding. So our work is cut out for us to make sure that we can uh, obtain our higher PQIs. If you remember from the earlier slide, we need to keep a 72 or 68 if we can. And um, right now we're falling a little bit, but we'll catch up. Um, some of these streets that aren't listed on here on this um, new data is that last year we did a, a huge resurfacing project. We did a rubber cage seal and a slurry seal in our newer areas that were on. The roads were about seven or eight years old and we were able to put a slurry on them right away. But um, it should bring it up. And in the next next year or two, we'll, we'll see this thing come up or at least level out. That's what we want. Is make sure we can maintain the level out. Jerry, we just had somebody ask, um, I don't I don't understand what these numbers mean, um, which is a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm sure you're not the only one. So could you just quickly explain um, what a PQI even is? And someone else is curious if that takes into account ride quality. So if you don't mind just quickly addressing that. Good question. Yes, um, it does take it ride quality. We've got the RCI, which is a ride quality index, um, which is in it. And then the next one would be SDI, which is a service distress. So basically looking at the street, you're seeing the cracks and evaluating those cracks and how many you have. And then we also do a um, evaluation of the road structure itself. And that we do a surface distress adequacy and that's where it's added in and we we've done uh, stress tests on the roads many years ago and we have that in our database and if it's an arterial um, the r value needs to be a little bit higher and it needs to handle heavy truck loads so we do a surface distress adequacy level on all of our roads and that's where the pqi comes in it adds that into it so a pci is basically a pavement condition index we add a little more and gets the pqi that's why our pqi is always going to be a little bit more than a PCI, which made, which most states use, and the state of California uses that well as, as an average. So. And why do you choose to use PQI instead of PCI? We've done that since day one, and that was a program that was implemented just before I got here, and we liked it, and we stayed with it. Um, we have a very robust program. We use road matrix, and um, we can project uh, five years out of what we're going to need for our road needs with how much money we have. So I like the program, and we just use that. So we. We can Got switch it. over to just PCI, but we just haven't done it yet. Got it. Um, so what I think is interesting about this graph is um, 2008, we know what happened. You're at a 78.9. Uh, four years later, 2012, you're at a 78, right? We see it start to kind of deteriorate from there, understand the correlation of adding center line miles. Um, right. But I, uh, I'm excited to kind of unpack how you did that. Uh, I want to start with one question to you, and that is, um, advice that you would give to agencies who are facing budget cuts, or if we end up looking at something that is even remotely similar to 2008 or in what ensued, do you have any kind of early advice? Yeah, we, we are in the same boat as everybody else right now with COVID-19. We don't know what the budget's going to be in the future. Um, we have most of our roads planned right now for the next few years, and we don't know if it's going to be there. So. The advice to give um, is what we would follow is, is keep the good roads good. Um, if you have those roads that are between seven and 10 years old and the PCI is up or PQI is up, um, put those on the plan and keep them resurfaced and get more done, get more square footage done and show your residents and customers that you're still being proactive and seal those roads. Um, if you just work on a couple of bad roads, you won't get much done and you'll lose ground. So keep the good roads good. Thank you. Want to um, talk a little bit about about your toolbox of treatments. This is one of the things I find really interesting about your story is what you introduced uh, to the city that was new to them, and you have uh, really introduced a very broad toolbox. So um, let's take a look at that. So we that's basically all the tools in this toolbox. We have more tools in the toolbox, but these are the ones we know and we've used. Um, we've tried many things in Roseville. We've done samples before we try any of these. We look at other agencies before we try them. Um, but the main one we're using right now is the slurry seals. We're getting five to 10 years out of those. Um, it's a wearing course for the road and it will last very well. We use a type one slurry on our bike trails, on our class one bike trails, and then a type two in all residentials. Um, and that's working very well for us. Microservice type twos we're using um, quite a bit. Sometimes we'll use that in residential and um, it's mainly used for the arterial streets and that's been holding up really well we don't use a type 3 microservice we find that the type 2 is very much it's smoother and it's not as rough not as coarse and then the rubber cape seal um, we're getting outstanding results from a rubber cape seal um, 10 to 15 years we use that in res residential 
And just five, about four or five years ago, I put on our first arterial road. Um, not sure how it was going to perform, but it seems to be doing great. We put it on a two mile stretch of road, uh, very heavily traveled. It's a truck, it's a truck route in Roseville and it only has two stops, two stop lights. So it's holding up very well. Um, I can talk about shoving and, and flushing of, of the material, but we won't get into that now, but that's one thing we use as well. Um, double chip seals, we've done that in residentials two different, two different times, and that's holding up very well. Actually, it's due now for another slurry. Chip seal over fabric, uh, we've done that on residential and in parking lots, and, extent, and it worked very well in a parking lot when we had to seal up. Full depth reclamation, we've had good success with a cold foam. Bonded wearing course, we use that when we, we on our arterials, and that's lasting 10 to 15 years, doing very well. We've got one bonded wearing course now that's around 11 years old, and we're ready to put a microsurface right back on top of that. Um, hot mix asphalt, HMA overlay, 10 to 15 years, a standard HMA with added fiber. We're using a lot of fiber on the bus stops for added strength. Um, seems to be working really well for us. HMA over fabric, uh, rubberized hot mix asphalt overlay. If we do a two inch overlay on an arterial, we always use uh, the rubber. We always put the rubber in. It's quieter um, and it holds up much better. And then with cold place and cycling, recycling. And then lastly, uh, RCC, roller compacted concrete. That's when a road has to be totally um, reconstructed. If you're not gonna do a full depth reclamation, maybe an FDR um, and RCC is another option. And we just did a $6 million project of a few streets just to see how it was gonna work out, show our, develop show our development community, um, how easy it goes in and how uh, indestructible it is. So, Jerry, I have a question for you. Yep. You uh, obviously probably didn't introduce all of these at one time. If no. you are looking at an agency who is, is the, in this position of, okay, I've got to stretch resources further, are there a couple of these that you would recommend as first treatments to try? It, it would depend on the climate where you're at, but if you're around the climate where we're at, we're mild, we, we freeze in the winter, we get the heavy rains, but we don't get the snow here like some people do, but um, you gotta get a get your road seal. Do the slurry seal, uh, microsurface type two is actually a, um, a little bit better slurry and and do and get a cape seal, rubber cape seal if you can. Um, more bang for the buck. Um, you can stretch your dollars a lot more and cover up the road and make it last. And when you're looking at less dollars, Jerry, is our recycling or rehab treatments, are those just off the table because they're too far down the curve? Or how do you think about that when you're looking at less money than you need? The rehab ones, we there comes a time where you have to rehab a road. Um, so we look at all, we look at every, every tool in the toolbox of what's most cost effective for us. Um, Sure, we could use a roller compacted concrete everywhere, but it's a little bit more expensive than a full depth reclamation. So we would probably use an FDR in some areas, but for long-term maintenance costs on FDR is a little more than a con concrete. So you do a cost analysis and, and project it over time and see where, you're, see where your money's gonna, you're gonna get both bank for the buck. Um, there's, there's many options out there to rehab a road, um, very ineffective one, not ineffective, less costly ones, and um, they just may not last as long, but if it gets you by for 10 years, that's great. Go ahead and use it if that's, if that's what your budget allows. Okay. Um, I, there's a lot of questions coming in about specific treatments. Um, we're gonna circle back to some of those at the end if we have time, uh, we'll keep moving for now. Thanks. Okay. So this was um, one of the, the roads we had, a road, road resurfacing in our residential. Um, this is uh, Palos Verdes Court. We did the whole neighborhood in a rubber cape seal. And this, this just to show that this is the, the before picture of that road um, of what it needed. Um, it was heavily cracked, had never been touched. It was over 20 years old at this time um, and it needed some work. Never even had any crack seal on it. So we came in and uh, did a little bit of crack sealing. Uh, we did some patching just to level it out the low spots. Very little R&R &R was done to this. We, we did some little mill and fill, took out some of the bad areas. Unless they were pumping, we didn't take it out. Uh, we just patch over those cracks and then put a rubber cape seal right on the top of it. And, and we what we're gonna go through today is a little bit of an example on how to use some of the tools on roadresource.org. Uh, when you're looking at a road similar to Palos Verdes Court, what are you considering? What are you thinking about? And Jerry, feel free to chime in 
I'm going to take us over to uh, Road Resource here in just a second and kind of walk through some of the tools that can help you to evaluate if you're not as familiar with the treatments Jerry's talking about. What are the things you should be considering and some tools to help you look at the, the road as a, as a problem. So here on roadresource.org, uh, this is a free website um, for anyone and everyone uh, who's looking at um, road maintenance and, and maintaining a network. This tool that we're gonna work through today is the pavement uh, criteria tool. It helps you to understand what treatment might be a, a good candidate for a given road. What we're gonna do is input the criteria for Palos Verdes Court as an example to show you how this tool works. So if I'm, if I'm Jerry considering what might be a good candidate for this road, I would input the criteria starting with the pavement condition of the, of the road. And in that photo, it was at about a C. Right. Which had uh, about moderate fatigue cracking. Is that right, Jerry? Yeah, correct. Oops, that's the wrong one. And we know that it's a local road, urban. It was a residential street. Yep. And a bituminous surface treatment. As you can see, while I'm putting in these factors, some of these options along the left here begin to gray out and some stay darker indicating that they might be a good candidate to fix a road in this condition. Now, obviously, this isn't a formal um, recommendation or um, you know, expert advice, but it is a great place to start when you're considering treatments. There are many factors to consider when evaluating road treatments, and you always wanna make sure you're putting the right treatment on the right road at the right time. Um, but here you can see scrub seal is indicated as a possibility for this road. And what the website does is gives you a few tools to understand a little bit about the possible treatments um, and to research them. So you can see some high level benefits, a little bit about Scrub Seal, the photo gallery, and then it gives you a link to the Treatment Resource Center, um, which you can access right here through this button. Or if you're just doing research on treatments, you can also find it in the top of the website. So in the There's treatment room. Quick on that real quick. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm just going to call out a few questions. We're not going to answer them right now, but while you're looking at this, we've received several questions about uh, cape seal, cold in place recycling, and what can go on the surface, chip seal, um, and uh, surface rejuvenators. So all of those have technical uh, information that you can find. I, I think every question that has been asked can be answered here. And I'll just take you through Cape Seal. Here's an example of the information that you can find on the Treatment Resource Center about Cape Seal. Obviously, that uh, high-level overview, you can learn things like process and variations. Jerry mentioned rubber Cape Seal. You can see the equipment variations, material variations, common combinations, really important things to learn when you're looking at a treatment as a whole, including expectations. What can I expect to see when I apply this uh, treatment on a road? with a PCI of 80 versus applying it on a road with a PCI of 40. Um, and then from there on out, best practices are scattered throughout the site, um, including things that um, you need from different phases of the project, pre-construction to construction, all the way down through quality assurance. Um, some helpful things to look at, testing protocol, which tests are required, which are recommended, um, troubleshooting, here are some things that over the years experts have compiled to know what you should be looking out for when you're applying a new treatment. All the way down to research and performance scholarly articles uh, and experiments that have been tested on these treatments. And research and success stories where you can learn about how other people are using treatments and finding success. So this is a great place to go. Uh, if you're looking at researching some of the treatments that Jerry went through in his tool toolbox, again, that's under the Treatment Toolbox section under the Treatment Resource Center. And that first tool that we explored, Pavement Criteria Tool. So this is a great place to start. Again, it's a free website. We're going to walk you through a few other tools as we go through the presentation, uh, but I'm going to circle back and let Jerry finish talking about Palos Verdes. While she's uh, loading that again, Jerry, we had one question that I know isn't answered there, and it's, um, would you recommend placing a surface treatment over a new pavement that has high wrap content? That has what? High wrap content? High wrap content, yeah. Um, yeah, 
Sure. I don't see why it would make any difference. Um, the wrap is just the rock, just pre-coated rock that goes into the material, um, and it shouldn't make a difference at all. Um, we haven't done that yet, so but we, it can be done. Yeah. Okay. And um, one more I'll just hit. Are these treatments only for roads? Uh, are they also for commercial projects like parking lots, for example? So we see a lot of really forward-thinking developers and property owners thinking about how to maintain their asphalt pavement with this stuff um, and, and certainly have some case studies on the website that are specific to uh, parking lots. Exactly. So, yes. Okay, Jerry, well, take us away um, quickly on Palos Verdes Courts. So here's the before picture and the after picture is coming. Or is it? Yeah, there it is. So this is 13 years after the rubber cape seal. Um, it's a little dirty right in there, and um, it, so don't let that fool you. It, it's nice and black. We use black rock all the time. Um, but as you can see in the bottom of the picture uh, towards the center, there's some major cracks in there and it's a little bit on the right as well. Uh, so some of those cracks did come through, but the good thing about a rubber cape seal is um, it's sealed on the bottom, and what you're seeing those cracks are is the hard surface because your type 2 slurry is a brittle surface and your, your rubber chip um is is movable and it expands and contracts but it stays sealed and the good thing is those cracks most of those don't go all the way through it's just the top layer that's cracking it may look like it goes down but if you dig that up it's not only a few are going down into the base and that's what we want we still got good coverage on this road um our next treatment on this road would probably be if my budget allowed um i would come here and do some crack seal and then put a type 2 slurry right on top of that and refresh the road so it's holding up very well So I will uh, quickly hit this concept of pavement preservation, probably familiar to many of you, though every time we uh, present it, uh, someone comes up and says, well, there's some ahas in there. So uh, this is particularly relevant if we're thinking about, essentially, if you got less money, how do you put your network on life support? So we'll look at a uh, typical deterioration curve. Um, and what you see, this is uh, exaggerated for you, but what you see is that over the first 75% of that pavement's life, it loses 40% uh, of its quality. And then over the next 12% loses another 40%. So we look at this point as a point of accelerated deterioration. So again, if you're stretching resources further, the question is how do I get above, how do I invest before my roads accelerate their deterioration and how do I kind of spread the money across the network keeping good roads good so that I don't accelerate a deteriorating network over time. And as you add these interventions, um, you'll see here that you're just continually keeping this road in better condition, protecting its condition, protecting the investment. And um, the other benefit is, is simply rideability quali quality and, and staying above that um, sort of mythical complaint line for uh, for taxpayers. One thing I'd add to that, Lindsay, is on that last slide, um, yeah. there's many of treatments you could hit. You know, you, it shows you go across there in your 15 and 20 that you do, you hit it. There's a point where you did in the good um, where it's probably a slurry seal. Even when it went down to fair, if you did a treatment then, you don't need to stay in the good and hit a treatment at the good range. You can hit it at the fair range as well and bring it right back up and, and refresh that curve. So um, just a point I want to make so you don't need to be in the B and the good. You can be in the C and the fair and bring it right back as well if you don't have the funding. Thank you. Well, and this is how guys like you're making roads last, asphalt roads last 40 years or more. Right. Um, okay, so you had a couple thoughts um, that you prepared for us about a pavement preservation program, whether you're new to this or whether you're just giving it a look again, a little differently in light of changing circumstances. Uh, Jerry, what are a few principles that people should keep in mind? You know, go for the low hanging fruit. Um, find those roads where your PCI or PQI levels are a little bit higher, but the age of the street is maybe, we use seven to 10 years out here because that's the climate and that's what works well for us and maybe different where you're at. But um, the low hanging fruit is those slurry seal roads. Keep those roads uh, sealed up. Um, keep the good roads good is what it comes down to. You can, you can stretch your dollars out it keeps your overall network average higher if you keep those good roads good so you can work on the bad roads or the roads that are in the middle of your uh, PCI, PQI range. So just keep the good roads good and, and put most of your budget towards the good roads. 
It's interesting when we when we think about these things from the website perspective, there are tools that sort of intersect with with the philosophies that Jerry's applied to his network since 2000. And in fact, a lot of our research was grounded in interviewing folks like Jerry. What what is an important thing to think about when you're thinking about low hanging fruit, those roads that are in good shape, you're actually spending um, based on the equivalent annualized cost of a treatment. So there's a there's a part on the website where you can check out equivalent annualized cost. Uh, essentially, what you're doing is comparing the true cost of treatments over the amount of time that they, um, amount of life extension that they provide to you. It's a really simple equation, but allows you to compare apples to apples, the cost of the treatment for the amount of life you're getting out of it. And so it's a great way to look at why spending at the top of the curve is more efficient spending than at the bottom. Or if you're looking at roads that are a little bit further deteriorated. Uh, and you're comparing options because you know they need to be treated. It can be um, really valuable there as well. And I see a couple of questions from earlier about cost comparisons. Um, that section of the website, if you click under the network section, um, there's a link to equivalent annualized cost and that will allow you to play with national average cost comparisons. You can also, um, when you're on the website, if you click on the top right hand um, corner, you'll see a login section and you can repopulate the tools on the site with costs that are relevant to your network because we know those costs vary so significantly from agency to agency and that data is always yours. It's nothing that anyone ever has access to. Jerry, talk to us a little bit about deteriorated roads when those just have to make the cut, right? Nobody gets to spend, you know, 100% of their money always on the good ones. So when, when these deteriorated roads have to be addressed, talk to us about that. Um, sure. There's there's always a way to do some type of treatment on, on some road. Um, we're fortunate here we have enough city staff. We have our own grinder and paver and stuff. We can do a lot of the uh, road prep ourselves. I know agencies don't have that. So we're, we're kind of fortunate in that, in that aspect. But um, with the toolbox, find the most cost-effective solution for that road. Um, there's always something out there you can do to that road to get it by. You may It may be a, a treatment that only gets you by for five years or seven years instead of the 15 or 20. That's okay. You can do that and do more of it. But you're bringing that up on the curve just a little bit. So search for those alternative treatments. Um, find out what other cities are doing, what other agencies are doing, and what's working for them. Um, talk to contractors about it. Some of the contractors are very sharp and they've done different things. So bring that road back up to the good condition so you can start maintaining it um, and do preventive maintenance on it. So once you get in the good con good condition, you can do the less expensive, the slurry seals and, and the microsurface treatments. Um, some people are even using fog seals on a road that's um, uh, very new just to keep it rejuvenated every three years, put a fog seal or something like that, or some type of rejuvenator. So there's always something out there. You just need to search for it and do a little bit of homework. And, and actually, Road Resource is a good, a good place to start. All right, quickly hit this example for us, Jerry, of the subdivision. We thought this was a really creative approach. So we have one subdivision, <clears throat> excuse me, um, built in 94, around 93, might be a little bit earlier than that. Um, they built in the winter time and they lime treated the base. Um, they wanted to, it was raining up here and they had a break in the rain, so they lime treated the base, put three to four inches of asphalt on top of all the residential streets, and then came back into the um, the asphalt on top. So we have anywhere from you know three to four, sometimes five inches of asphalt on top of that lime treated base. So we did a slurry in, in 06, um, and then 05 and 06, we put a slurry on it as we should. We were a little bit behind the curve on that one, but the roads were still in good condition because they had such thick uh, uh, asphalt out there. And did fine, did the uh, slurry seal, we did the crack seal, then the slurry obviously. And within a um, few years, we started getting complaints because we started getting major cracks out there. So we got two types of sections in the roads out there. We've got a type A with cracks every 100, 200 feet. And then type B is cracks every 20 feet. And we're talking a crack anywhere from one inch, two inch, four inches wide sometimes. Um, and we need to start addressing them. So we've been crack sealing those. We've got other material we've put in, put in there to work. And then we actually started digging out the cracks, you know, 12 to 18 inches, replacing the asphalt, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we end up with two more small cracks on the side of that because the asphalt just keeps moving and shrinking. So the plan is out there. We've got a big subdivision, a larger subdivision. They're very vocal. And we've got a four-year plan in place. We're going to be crack sealing. We're going to be replacing the AC on those large cracks and just digging them out. 
And we found out that we can't keep digging out every crack. There's just too many of them on some, some of these roads where you've got a crack every 20 feet. We need to redo the whole road. So what's our mm -hmm. option? So we got to go back to the toolbox. We recycle that whole road. We take it all up and start over again and take out that lime treated base, um, which is actually a good hard base. We don't want to touch that. So the plan is we're going to recycle that. We're going to, the streets that need it, we're going to take all the asphalt out. We're going to stockpile it about a mile away. We're going to bring in a central plant. We're going to remix, remix that into asphalt and put it back down uh, for the roads that are, have the major uh, cracking. The rest of the roads will fix the cracks, do some more crack seal. And then the final product is going to be a rubber, rubber cave seal with fabric over the whole thing. And, and we're hoping that this will deflect some of that cracking coming through again by having the fabric on there and the rubber, uh, rubber emulsion on there as well. So that's the plan. It's, um, it's not cheap, but we phased it out over four years to, to help get the work done. So a lot of work in the subdivision. So we've got a little bit of an example to demonstrate how that works. Uh, a few weeks ago, we went through the remaining service life calculator on our webinar. Today, we're gonna go through an example on the life cycle cost calculator. And what we're gonna look at is, as Jerry's bringing that subdivision, those type B sections that need to be recycled, as he's bringing them up to good health, what do the next 40 years of life look like for that road? And um, how do we evaluate the cost of that road to maintain? preventatively versus the conventional um, um, as we go. So I've got an, this open in another window. You'll bear with me. So I've gone ahead and input um, two comparison plans. On the left side, you'll see the, convention, the conventional plan um, where an agency might mill and fill every 10 to 15 years here. It's every 15 years, uh, which is one way of maintaining your roads. You wait for the road to fail bring it back up to good, wait for it to fail, and bring it back up to good, maintaining that way as you go. But as Jerry outlined, what he's looking at is doing, um, is recycling that road. Here we've got an FDR and then putting a slurry on top of that. So as we pull this out um, and look at maintaining that road now that it's gonna be in good shape after this intervention, um, how, how do we look at the rest of the life cycle of that road? And um, a simple caveat here, this calculator is, um, it calculates the, the time value of money and it's not a true um, life cycle cost calculator, um, which if you look at the FHWA website includes things like salvage costs and user costs. This simply evaluates the value of your money today as you go. And, and maintaining a network, a road over the 40 years of its life. So after he does this first intervention, you can see we've got year zero input here so that we are not calculating future costs. Um, we're gonna go ahead and share the next interventions as Jerry might maintain his road. So after this intervention, he might do a crack seal seven years in uh, to keep those cracks filled. Correct. And then a slurry after 10 years. And then again, Jerry, as you outlined this, again, this isn't a recommendation, but this is a, an approach to maintaining your network that you've used before um, with crack seals and slurry seals, correct? correct? Correct, yep. And then 30, at year 30, we've got another slurry. And then at 37, crack seal. And that's gonna take us into the, those next um, years of life, maintaining that road preventatively compared to the conventional plan, we save about three million uh, and a half dollars, three and a half million dollars um, by maintaining a road preventatively and keeping it above, um, keeping it in good shape as we go. So just a nice example of how those calculators function. I've input my paved area, inflation and interest rate. Again, not a formal recommendation, but an example of how the principles play out when you really put them to work. This is also a great tool if you're, if you're trying to communicate with decision makers or electeds and demonstrate the value of preventatively maintaining your, your roads. Even if they're in bad shape right now, you can bring them back up to good and get them on the right track. And Grace, will you just scroll up to the top of the screen and show them where the login function is? Uh, all those costs you can change in the calculator or if you wanna just change them once, you log in there and it will um, allow you to populate the website. Uh, the calculator tools on the site with costs that are relevant to you. Uh, so just want to make sure you guys know where that's at. Uh, so no question that any of 
any any agency that we have spoken with cites communicating with taxpayers uh, or communication in general as uh, sometimes challenge, really important, um, and a critical part of the job. So we know that when we talk about communication, you guys are balancing communication to a lot of different audiences. And those include um, decision makers who hold the purse strings. So uh, people who are allocating funding. Grace, do you mind clicking to the next one? Thank you. Um, people allocating funding, right? We know they need a certain type of communication. As Grace mentioned, that life cycle tool is pretty valuable for that. Um, and we took you straight to the calculator page, but with all the calculators, there's also an about page that teaches concepts and shows examples. And we have seen those examples really resonate with decision makers who don't understand all the technical concepts and roads, but do understand what it means to protect taxpayer dollars and stretch budgets further. Uh, neighboring agencies, um, how do you learn and uh, compare what they're doing, what you're doing, um, and what you, what you can kind of benefit from each other? And then um, residents, how do you educate residents and explain a rationale for why certain roads are getting treated over other roads? Jerry, I know that you are as proactive as any um, manager that I've met uh, about doing this. So love you to show a few of these examples and how you've communicated with different groups. Um, sure, I'll go through it quickly. I know time is of the essence right now, but uh, we use the we use these charts and graphs to show everybody what's going on all the time. Um, for the decision makers, uh, we need to show them what our network target is. Ours is 72 and 68. Our current funding path, and then do nothing. Uh, we always need to show to do nothing because I mean, if you do nothing, like you can see in this, uh, pictures worth a thousand words. Um, your, your your network level is going to just take a dive. Um, so this is a great chart just to show everybody where you're at. The next one is the 2020 PQI rating. Um, this is where we are today. That we did this a little while ago. Um, you can see from the chart. Let me see if I can see mine a little bit better. But uh, you get into the green. Um, those are ones to the west area. We've done those with the slurry still. The PQIs are really high. You go into the center of town. Um, the reds. That's an area we haven't hit in many years, and um, the PQI is not doing as well. So. Picture's worth a thousand words. We use this for our residents. We use this for internal staff. We use this to get extra funding just to show everybody where we're at and how it, how it changes in time. And um, if you go to the next slide, that's that's where your 2027 projected PQI rating is do nothing. So remember all the green that we had on the left? Well, that's now your gold, your browns, your blues. Um, and then the red during in the middle is um, still red. I mean, it's just still in bad shape, but PCI, PQI keeps, keeps diving down. So we use this a lot. We do neighborhood meetings. We do reach outs any way we can to the residents and we show them this information just to show them where we're at and try to educate them on what we're doing. It's so powerful to visually see that impact. Yeah. The other thing you guys did was, was spend time um, learning from each other and I think this is interesting. We did. Um, we were we were kind of doing it just on our own. I got to know the, ex the superintendents, supervisors from around the agencies around us. Um, but now we have a group that we meet with, um, actually it's in the city, city of SAC is part of it and, and other counties around are part of it. Um, and we, we do a quarterly meeting. We, what are you doing? What are the projects you guys are doing? Uh, what's working for you now? Um, what isn't working? Did, and what, what type of roads are you guys working on? Uh, then we work on the problem solving aspect of it as well. Is it, have you had any problems? Was there a contractor problem that had made a mistake? Or was it in the specs? Uh, maybe we need to change the specifications because we all share our specifications because we're all doing the same type of work on different types of roads. Um, who's doing quality work? You know, is it, we have a lot of uh, core contractors that work around here. We get some new ones come in once in a while, more people are doing it, but who's the best one right now? Who do you, who do you hope to get bids from and um, to do your work and how are they doing? Um, hiring and networking, um, how's it going on the hiring process? Who are you hiring and how, where are you networking? How are you getting your people for uh, good staff to come on board? And, and it's just overall networking to see what's going on. Um, we're not doing, we're not doing anything that anybody else can, shouldn't be doing or can be doing. Um, so we need to network with each other and learn from each other so we can avoid mistakes and come out with a better product. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna skip this one. Um, we just wanna highlight a couple tools that are available for you all on um, on road resource to specifically help communicate with taxpayers. So we're gonna show two types of tools. 
Um, and then a video that is designed um, for you all, but also for you all to use. Uh, any agency that we've had a chance to talk to that has successfully either reversed a deteriorating network or stemmed the decline um, has had some successful element of communication to electeds and taxpayers. Uh, so we thought, okay, let's, uh, that'd be a valuable thing to provide you with some tools to do that. So scrolling down to the bottom, there's some downloadable one pagers that are very taxpayer facing. Um, they talk about your commitment to preservation, to recycling, to network management. This is all stuff that's free and easy for you to download, use on your websites, on your social, um, or in a just general communication. And then um, we'll quickly show you this video. It's about um, uh, a minute 50, and then we'll uh, use the last few minutes to uh, share some of your questions with Jerry. Let me turn the, the sound on first. So you've got an asphalt road. Every year that road gets a little further from new. Left untreated, that pavement will only last 10 to 15 years. Some cities and counties wait until the road is in need of major repairs before they remove and replace the pavement. That type of fix gets really costly. Especially you know, Rick, let's go ahead and pause this. It's not um, playing very well, uh, I think, with so many attendees online. So we'll include a link to this video in the follow-up that we send out. Um, but you kind of get a sense of um, the quality and the, really the accessible way of, of talking about roads and kind of arming you with that important communication um, to help people understand all the hard work and proactivity that goes into the planning that you're doing. Um, and that it's not just a matter of squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, for those of you who've asked, yes, the uh, the slideshow will be available for download and we'll, we will also load the webinar online. Grace, if you'll just quickly show them the resources page where they can find the webinars. If you did not have a chance to watch the one from a couple of weeks ago where we interviewed John Livesey, uh, that's another really powerful example of network level change. Um, Jerry, so many questions coming in. Um, I'm going to pick a few. There were uh, several questions about ADA improvement and how um, how your treatment selection is influenced by treatments that trigger ADA improvements um, or how you manage those upgrade requirements um, while, while thinking about your toolbox and your long-term budgeting. Do you mind speaking to that a little bit? Right. I uh, would be happy to. That's a major function of our program now. Um, never used to be because we could stay in the ADA, but with the ADA requirements now, we have to get our, our ramps upgraded and all the ADA, uh, be in ADA compliance, so to speak. Um, we're spending a lot of money on upgrading our ramps. When we do a large neighborhood like the one I uh, told about earlier, we'll spend two, probably two to three million dollars in that project just on ramps. So we have to budget for that as well. Uh, we try to pick the treatment where it does not trigger a ramp. Um, that's why if we keep the good roads good and use a slurry, it won't trigger that. But when you get into multi-layer systems, it, it will trigger the uh, ADA uh, uh, upgrades that, to get that done. So we do the ADA, ADA uh, upgrades a year or two before the project, and then we do the project after that to get all that out of the way and get it done. But it's a major impact to our program now. We're spending probably 20% of our money on ADA um, and not doing resurfacing. So mm -hmm. that's the question. Um, there are a lot of technical questions. What, what we will try to do is funnel the questions we don't have a chance to get to today to Jerry and then circulate them for everyone to learn from. Sure. Um, one, there were a couple questions about the, um, uh, one of the examples, Jerry, it was the last one. Um, I think that was Palos Verdes Court, uh, but I'm not sure. They want to know what about um, two questions. What about considering mastic for the larger cracks that are too far gone for crack sealing, and why would you mill mill that out and bring in a plant versus recycling that HMA in place? Good question. Um, we are using mastic. We actually just purchased a new mastic machine because we were renting one for a while, um, so we're using that extensively. In that subdivision I talked about, the big subdivision, we're using mastic. We're using crack seal. Um, and then the cracks that are too wide or too many of them, that's when we're recycling the road. And we did a cost uh, cost benefit analysis. And we found by the time we put mastic in there or redid the pavement, 
um, we're better off recycling those roads. It's just a few, we're just doing a few hit and miss roads and uh, the cost benefit analysis came up to recycle it. But we are using Mastic and it's a great product. Um, okay, well, I think with that, uh, most of the other questions were a little bit specific. So we will uh, make sure that we answer those and send them out to you. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much for your time. I know it's busy. All of you who took the time to join us, we know that you are balancing demands from many places. So again, we thank you for what you're doing and uh, we will be sending a poll. We have a poll that we'll be populating um, just as soon as we close the webinar and then we'll be sending something out in email. So please pay attention to that as we continue to shape this tool and make it something useful for you. I'll remind you that we do have uh, PPRA channels on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. So uh, those are places where we're constantly taking snapshots from the 500 pages of the website and making them available to you so that you can um, so that you can kind of keep learning how to use the tool. So again, thanks everyone for your time. Jerry, thanks especially for sharing what's going on behind the scenes out there at the city of Roseville. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Allie, are we done? I think are we we're done? still on. Just back to us. Hmm. I think we're still on. We can start telling jokes. <laughs> Everybody's in. Well, I'll make, make everybody exit the webinar real fast. <laughs> Jerry, there were a lot of uh, technical questions. Oh, was there? Good. <laughs> and somebody specifically wanted to know, I thought this was funny, just for an example, would Cordwell Circle be a good place for a rubber cape seal? Is that, is that something?